Um, so the first sort of follow-up question for today um, is when we're looking at a rational tangle and it's presented to us in twist form, as this one is right here, um, what are some systematic ways that we can approach understanding what the, how, that, how that tangle is a continued fraction, right? How, how, it, how it exists as a continued fraction. Um, and so my recommendation is to untwist it like you're untwisting a twist tie, right? And it helps me when I do this to actually do the, to actually erase those parts of a tangle that I'm untwisting as I go. Um, so looking at this, the first part I would untwist would be this pair of crossings over here on the right. Um, which, again, the, the overstrand is positive slope, so we're going to call this a positive 2. Um, and so when I erase those, and then I've accounted for this positive 2 here at the end, um, now, if I erase all the way back down to there, now I can see that I have the next thing I can untwist are these three right here. And then I, so I untwist those, also positive because the um, overstrand has a positive slope. Untwist, untwist, um, and so now in the original diagram, um, it's kind of hard to spot like slopes in this because these these crossings are kind of going vertical. So what I would just do is, you know, what we call a planar isotopy, where we just kind of take this, take these strands and just imagine kind of stretching them horizontally in both directions, like this way and, and this way. Um, and then draw them out a little bit so that what I'm looking at is uh, that. And so now I can see that this is a negative two. So I guess my, my advice there is to wait uh, for identifying positives or negatives until you've untwisted everything that comes before it. Right? And then if you need to, sort of pull the ends out a little bit to see whether you actually have an upslope or a downslope. Yeah, so what we just did is we provided a recipe for untwisting yeah. this tangle. Um, but when we describe a tangle from the beginning, um, we would be describing in a recipe, in a continued fraction recipe, how to start. Right? So as a continued fraction, the last, or maybe another way to say it is that the, well, let me see here. So this was 2 uh, over here, then 3, then negative 2. When I'm building a tangle determined by a continued fraction, the first twisting I would do is this twist down here at the bottom in the order of operations. Like if I were building this, this would be the first thing that happens. Um, so the very first twist in building a tangle is going to be this twist down here at the bottom. And then we build it going from the bottom to the outside. But then when you write the continued fraction notation, um, the first thing that you write in continued fraction is actually this first thing at the, at the front. And so we kind of write the notation backwards from the way that the tangle is actually built. Um, if we just think abstractly about a continued fraction that's written a1, a2, up to an, um, it's the an twist here at the end that's actually the first twist that happens um, in your continued fraction tangle. And so, um, so I, would, I would argue that in our example that we were looking at, this very last thing uh, in the continued fraction should be the first tangle that we would do that was the last tangle to be untwisted. So the last tangle that we untwisted was this minus 2, which should be the first tangle that we twist when we're building the, the thing. Um, so as a continued fraction, we would write it as minus 2, 3, 2. Um, with the understanding that, or wait, how do I want to say this? As a continued fraction, yeah, let me backpedal on that for a second. As a continued fraction, this minus 2 would be the first twist that we would make. So we would do this. Then we would multiply by 1 over 3 to get these three vertical twists in here. And then to that, we would add two horizontal twists. And that would build us this tangle. Right? But then as a continued fraction, those terms would reverse. Would be my take on this. That 
and when we write this in its continued fraction form, what we really have is um, 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over minus 2. which we can then find the tangle number of just by taking those brackets away and evaluating the rational number. So I think for me, the, the, the step where we kind of think about that reversal uh, is the step in which um, we go from a diagram to a continued fraction, right, or vice versa. Uh, that when we, write it, you, when we write it using this continued fraction notation, it's really this last, uh, this last set of twists here that is the first twist that happens when we actually build this tangle. And then we read from right to left. So this continued fraction representation has an odd number of terms, an odd length, right? Um, but we wouldn't call this a canonical representation for this continued fraction because uh, not all the terms have the same sign. So it turns out that we can, there is a way to re-express this continued fraction using either all positive or all negative twists. Um, so this isn't in its canonical form. That's okay, though. I mean, if we build a tangle using this continued fraction or if we build it using a different representation for the same, as long as the rational number is the same underneath, the tangle that we get is going to be equivalent underneath, which is the real miracle behind the Conway theorem. Right? Um, and that we can have multiple representations of the same rational number using different continued fractions, but that their tangles are all going to be equivalent, even if it may not seem so uh, up front. So an interesting exercise, I suppose, uh, would be to take this particular tangle, which does use a mixture of signs, not all positive, not all negative, um, and see if there is some sequence of flips or Reitermeister moves or other isotopy moves that we can do, horizontal flips, vertical flips, um, to this tangle to actually get it into that canonical form uh, with an odd length and with, a, uh, with the same sign on all the terms. And the trick is, that's a hard question if we're thinking about it as a tangle question. But if we think of it as a rational number question, we have an algorithm for discovering the canonical form for the rational number continued fraction. So whatever rational number this ends up being, let's actually do that calculation here. 12, 12 fifths, you said? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, Adam says the same thing. Um, right, so this happens to be 12 fifths. And if we apply the algorithm for determining the canonical form of 12 fifths as a continued fraction, that will also show us how to build this as a canonical form rational tangle uh, with an odd length uh, and with the twists either all being positive or all being negative twists. And to me, it's really surprising that that's possible for any rational tangle. Um, but the power of Conway's theorem is it's possible for rational tangles exactly because it's possible for rational numbers. Uh, and there is a nice one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. So the second question is, um, in Adam's exposition of rational tangles, um, instead of talking about rotation as being the fundamental operation, he talks about the northwest southeast reflection as being the, the, the operation that we, that we can create new tangles from old. Um, I can give you kind of a couple of reasons why that might be, uh, why he might have made that choice, uh, and then try to justify why that's really, he's talking about the same theory that we're talking about. Uh, so first of all, From a practical perspective, uh, applying this rotation is going to preserve the orientations of the twists. So what we had in this picture here, he begins with the twist positive 3, horizontal twist positive 3. Um, and after applying this reflection, now he ends up with 1 over positive 3. Right? The twists are still oriented positively. They're just vertical instead of horizontal um, because the upslopes are still going over in both cases. Um, so that's the practical reason. Um, but thinking about the theory for a moment, um, I think it's also well justified from that perspective that we, when we were first talking about tangles, um, we had thought of the basic operations as twisting, all right, adding a twist on one end, which I think maybe we'll now consider this upslope twist to be how it works. So this is TG, right? It's applying a twist to extra twist to the end over there. Um, and the other operation that we talked about was just a 90 degree rotation. So we just take this and turn it into that. Um, but 
in our first exposure to this, what we reasoned our way into is that this was represented in, uh, not T, sorry, this was represented in the rational numbers by the opposite reciprocal. Uh, and so it's worth thinking about if, if we don't want an opposite reciprocal, if we want a, a regular reciprocal instead, then we would not only want to rotate by 90 degrees, we would also want to reflect, reverse the orientations of all the crossings. Um, and that rotation combined with a uh, reflection, I'm sorry, combined with a reversal, um, should give us the reflection about that line. Um, let me let me pause on that for a second. Um, um, but that's something that we would want to verify. Right? That if it's true that the group which is generated by our original translation and, and uh, rotation operations is the same as the group which is generated by that translation and this reflection, um, then that should verify for us that we're really describing the same tangled group at the end of the day. And so it's OK to do one instead of the other. Um, but there's some, there's some algebra or possibly some geometry uh, to do there to convince ourselves that those really are the same.